So welcome everybody. So this is a UN UK uh, Harrogate um, uh, group meeting. It's the 18th of September. Uh, my name is Emma Nicholson. I'm UN UK Harrogate chair. Um, and the book um, we are going to hear about tonight is a book in the making by Clive Wilson, previous UN UK Harrogate chair. It's called Leading Beyond Sustainability. And now I'm going to hand over to Clive. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Emma, and uh, nice to be with you all, either in person or online. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So I'm going to share a screen because I'm going to take you through the general concept of the book, uh, which, before we started recording, just a little bit, a bit of the theme, as Emma pointed out, we uh, are facing many challenges in the world, not least of which climate change. And wars in various parts of the world and just collapse of ecosystems and we've been trying to tackle those things for many years and what i've been trying to do with this book is to look beyond that because and this is not in any way to denigrate the fabulous work that is going on to tackle those things as problems and there are also some people that are, that are missing that as an inspiration to step into action. So this actually looks beyond it. And it will become apparent as I, as I go on. But this is trying to tell a positive story of what the world will be like um, probably 10, 20 years from now. And, uh, and it's a, a much brighter future for humanity. And what does that look like? So I'm going to share my screen. And we'll get cracking. So there are some uh, there are some key things to just point out on the slide already, and you'll notice the title "Leading Beyond Sustainability." The subtitle six aspirations for a brighter future," and you notice as well that you can read the smaller type a phrase every time we notice, encourage, and celebrate somebody who is changing the world. We are changing the world. And, and that's really significant because a lot of people look at some of the challenges we face and think, I can't do anything about that. World peace, how on earth can, can I move us toward, towards world peace as, as an example? And the point is we can, because every time we notice, encourage and celebrate something that's making a difference, we're making a difference. So, I'd like to begin by asking you to think about a brighter future. So ignore the words on the screen for a moment. Just close your eyes and uh, put yourself into some point in the future where the world is as you would like it to be. Paradise here on Earth, um, but not so far-fetched that it's science fiction, something realistic and the sort of world that you would like to see in the future. And to help you envisage that, you can visit anywhere in the world you like. You can be in a, a town, a city, the bottom of the sea, top of a mountain, in a forest, go anywhere you like. And in this paradise, what do you see? And you can take the time to maybe visit somewhere else somewhere a bit different, or you can stay where you are. What is the world that you see? And then with your smartphones, you'll need to open your eyes for this bit. You can point it at the QR code on the screen there. If you need to get out of your chair and go, go a bit closer to do it, then fine, but it should reach. It should open up a slide of screen for you. And I'm going to act on David's behalf. You need the camera, just go to the QR code and then open the website that you're prompted to. And what you can see on the screen already is the data from a previous session. I thought as this is a smaller group, we begin by another group's ideas. But the most important thing is what are your ideas? 
So just enter a word or a short phrase into Slido, press send on the screen, or in David's case, just shout out and I'll put it in for you. Peace. Peace, fantastic. And if everybody else does it online, Anything else, David? It was harmony. You've noticed you can have as many responses as you like, so just keep going back and adding more. And you'll see that as you shout things out, David, they get added into the into the word cloud. Is everybody else managing to get on, do things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you managing, Anna? No. <laughs> you got your camera on? Yeah. Can't see my own. I'm not doing that. Do I need to put my cue up? Or you no, you just need your camera. Camera. Okay. Put your camera back on. Okay. I'll get you on. Thank you. Sorry. Those of you that uh, are on can carry on using this. Yeah. Is it no. Okay. okay. There's another way. I do have a download queue. I don't understand your, your phone at all. <laughs> so slido.com. Mm. Enter code. What sort of phone is this, Emma? Android. Control one. Five. <laughs> right, you can enter your words and just keep pressing oh, send and going back okay. and you've got to do it. Make it the rest of your money to get on. Anything else you'd like me to add, David? There's a hell of a lot there. Well, if I can encourage you all to, this is going to sound a bit bizarre, but listen with your eyes. If you see things on the screen and you think, actually, yes, I'd like to see that in the future, start typing the same word or phrase. Slido will recognize and it'll give you the option you can just put it in again. And what that will do is it'll make that word or phrase go bigger in the scheme of things. So when you say there's something in there that resonates, David, what, what is it? Clean oceans. Clean oceans, right. So keep your eye on that clean oceans. Mm. And see what happens to it. Did you see? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anything else that resonates, David? No hunger. No hunger. Anything else? Or anything else from your imagination? Something new? There's more about anxiety, not anxiety. I lost it now because they're moving around. <laughs> because these guys are busy. <laughs> What sort of thing was it? Biodiversity. Biodiversity, mm -hmm. okay. Increasing biodiversity, that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else, David? Anybody watching this, be, <laughs> be aware of the fact that several people are putting words in other than the David that I'm speaking with. Mm -hmm. Anything else, David? Um, quality, quality, lovely. Has everybody exhausted their ideas of their paradise? Mm. Okay.
So anybody wish to comment on what you see on the screen? The word clean is there a few times. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot about cleanliness, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Clean energy, and what are the things? Clean oceans, clean water. Stability and strength. Mm. Yeah. Stable climate. There's a three a theme between cooperation, more equality, community, yeah. selflessness, and so on. Fantastic. Any other comments, thoughts? Well, it is a utopia. A utopia. Mm. Well, let's let's it, let's look it's on. It's not, it's good to strive for, but it is definitely a utopia. So the logic of the book is really based on, uh, if you think about karate, when you see these black belts trying to smash a piece of wood, mm -hmm. they don't aim for the wood. They aim for a space beyond the wood. Here's a man who knows a little bit about martial arts. Am I, am I right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 they aim mm -hmm. beyond the wood, and it's the power of going beyond that actually breaks the wood. And this is the, the logic behind the book, is that if we look beyond sustainability to what the actual better future is that we'd like to see, we will we'll achieve sustainability in the process. And the book talks about six aspirations for a better future. And those are the six. So if you think about peace, uh, which I define as no war, not at all, and declining levels of violence. The reason I talk about declining levels of violence is that you could arguably say there will always be violence in the world, but we will gradually raise the bar so that uh, there will be more peace in the world. Mm. And then connection, which is interesting, it was going to be an aspiration that I was going to call love, so I really, really thought about it. And it embraces all forms of connection. So if you think about the internet and social media, the way we're connected as a global species these days, but also all those emotional forms of connection like collaboration, compassion, love, kindness. Abundance, meaning enough of everything for us to all lead the sort of lives that we would like to be able to see. In the words of Schumacher, you know, live simpler that others may simply live. Mm. Enough for everybody's need, but nobody's greed. All those wonderful phrases spring to mind. But abundance of resources, food, water, energy, services, and wealth. Vitality, meaning vitality or well-being, not just of us as individuals, but as a species. Mm. So um, a thriving humanity, but also a wealth of ecosystem, of all of life and the planet that we live in. And um, wisdom to do the right thing in the right way at the right time, and opportunity for things like learning, growth, and contribution. And if you think about those as aspirations, this is something that most of the people in the room here are very familiar with, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I did an analysis. so. So where did the six aspirations come from? They came from me having conversations over eight years, basically since the Sustainable Development Goals came out, with literally thousands of people across three or four continents, most of it online, sadly, or not sadly, depending on your point of view, but thousands of people, and just asking them the same questions I asked you, mm -hmm. except at that time, particularly earlier on, it was at the timestamp of 2030. Imagine a world you'd like to see for 2030. Mm -hmm. To bring from then, from first principles, what are the sustainable development goals? Because I began this when very few people knew of the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, when you do the analysis, or when I did the analysis, and you start to allocate the SDGs to those six aspirations, they map quite nicely, with the exception of wisdom. And so there isn't a single SDG that maps directly to wisdom. You could argue that wisdom is a thread that runs through all 17. That the SDGs themselves have come from a source of, of wisdom. So I think everything that was in the SDGs is in the six aspirations. Why six? Well, it's just an easy number to remember. 
Uh, I've been working with SDGs for eight years now, and and I still some just said name them. It's like it's hard, isn't it, Jemima? It's, it's really it's hard. A list of seventeen. It's a big, it's a big list, and it's useful. You know, it's a useful list because we can break it down into targets and goals and all sorts of things. And this is this this relates back to what Emma was saying about the disruptions that are going on in the world. You know, there is a tendency for us to look at the news and think, goodness, what is going on? It's like bad news almost every day. Mm -hmm. News of another war, news of uh, climate chaos, fires, floods, rising sea levels, and it can get quite depressing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to introduce you to just three of the books that I've read uh, in my research for this book. The first being Rethinking Humanity from the think tank Rethink X in, uh, in, the, in the States. And basically, Rethink X proposed that disruption in a number of sectors, mainly things like energy, transport, food, labor, information, was happening at such a pace that the world in 10 years time will be unrecognizable from what it is today. So if you think, for example, uh, in energy, the move to renewable energy is happening so quick. And as and it's it's um, it's exponential is the is the change. And of course, as the cost of renewables reduces, which it is doing, it forces out the other fuels. So fossil fuels get um, priced out of the market unless the market is artificially um, moved in some way that is uh, that is unhelpful. Same with um, transport, the move to electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, transport as a service, which is key to where we're going because it's not just about changing vehicles to electric, but it's also having fewer of them to manufacture on the road. And when you've got electric vehicles that can do a million miles in their lifetime to get the value out of them, you've got to put them into fleets. And so if you're interested in this, do check out the Rethinking Humanity book. It's available online, it's free to download and, and, and see what happens. Stephen Pinker was also influ influential in my thinking and his book, Rationality. I first came across Steve Pinker when he was talking about violence because it's very tempting to think that we live in a world where violence is on the increase. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is if you look to the Ukraine war and, and so on. But mm -hmm. if you look back over longer periods, you'll see that we actually live in one of the most peaceful times in all of, in all of history. And what Pinker does is to encourage us to look at the data. You know, don't just look at the news headlines or what's going on in social media. Look at the data to see how the world is changing. And I'll show you a few little bits of data as an example. Brighter, Adam Dorr, just for completeness, he's actually one of the Rethink X uh, think tank. He's not the same author. You can probably just about see James Harvey and Tony Seaver authoring Rethinking Humanity. Adam Dorr not only wrote the book Brighter, which my daughter bought me for Christmas, um, but he's also got the whole thing really explained in a series of YouTube videos if you want to dip in and uh, see what he's got to say. But he very much talks about, and you notice the letter S on the front there, that's, that's a lot, part of a life cycle curve. Mm -hmm. Is basically saying that progress happens exponentially, and that's why we should expect significant progress in the uh, the coming decade or two. Mm -hmm. So, um, looking at each aspiration in turn, and you'll notice this order is different than the way they were in my um, original slide, and that's because. I think the first aspiration, that of connection, should be the first, and I'm going to reorder that slide at some point. Um, but if you think about connection, just in terms of practical, the number of internet users that there are in the world, and you've got world population on the red curve, and internet users um, plotted below, and we're coming to a, to a place where everybody's online. You know, very, very quickly, we will get to that point where just about everybody on the planet will be online. So we're more connected as a species than ever before. Look at social media. And again, you can see the uh, the graphs there. 
And then look at the users of Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp. You know, we take all these things for granted, but you've only got to go back to 2006, mm -hmm. not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And we weren't connected in that way at all. Mm -hmm. So um, we've come a long, long way. And in the book, I tell the stories of um, what I call personal encounters. These are people that I've known during my career, my life, who are doing amazing things. What the book basically says is there are lots of amazing people. There's, you know, for a start, there's people in this room. There's Esther in Scarborough online, and there are others that will look at the um, video who are doing amazing things to take us to that brighter future. And actually, the more I engage with uh, people in the world of work, and you actually work out what they what they really do, come on to that, we've got something like, you know, billions of people on the planet all aiming at the same brighter future. The trouble is most of them don't know it. That's not in their consciousness. So the first photograph there, um, I, this was just after the Sustainable Development Goals came out. I was invited to go to New York, to the United Nations. The, the people that I'm celebrating there are uh, John Campbell and uh, Phil Clovier. Basically, we were walking just down the road from Harrogate here to Harlow Car Gardens, and John's phone rang, and all I heard him say was, I don't know, I'll ask him. And it was Phil ringing John to say, could you and Clive come and facilitate a workshop for... 500 young leaders at this Youth Action Summit at the UN um, to talk about um, how to introduce the SDGs to young people. So as it happened, this was, I think, late November, beginning of December, we looked at our diaries and with a bit of shuffling, we were able to go. So we went and we facilitated. And the young man down towards the bottom left in the bright white T-shirt, in fact, I can just move my cursor, this chap, Mm -hmm. uh, Fede or Federico um, was one of the young people and he uh, took on a, a goal to connect all young people on the planet to the SDGs and this is just one of the events that he did and you can see all the young people in the SDGs and, and so on. So, so in terms of connection, he was already at that stage doing phenomenal amounts of work towards connection. Very, very different. Nick and Linda, they're just around the corner from here. Linda used to work as a careers advisor with my wife, wife Francis. Nick is her husband. She got dementia early onset in uh, when she was about 50, I think, when it came on. And Nick had to give up his uh, career as a civil servant to look after her, which he's still doing today. Um, but the point is, this is how connection works. Think things happen in our lives and we connect to a challenge and we go with that. And, uh, and because of where Nick is and the, the book tells the story of me having a conversation with him and saying, you know, it must be hard. And he said, yes, it is hard. And it's given me more purpose in my life than I've ever experienced before. So I'm whizzing through all these. Uh, Neville Beavis, the gentleman with the beard on the left and is in the right as well, um, was actually my son's biology teacher at uh, Asheville. And um, Neville decided to go out to run the Open Arms Infant Home. Many of you know about Open Arms in this room um, in Malawi, poorest country in the world at the time, looking after kids that have been um, orphaned uh, mainly due to things like HIV AIDS. And the little chap. Uh, in the dungarees, this fella here, um, I started to raise funds for Open Arms uh, shortly after Neville went out. And after we'd raised a significant amount, I thought I'd better go to Malawi and see what they're spending it on. So I went to Malawi, went to the infant home, and this chap came right across the yard, threw his arms around me and said, uh, hello, my name's Wilton. And I said, <laughs> That's my name. We must be brothers. So we um, we had a laugh and a joke. He showed me around the infant home, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still in connection with him. He's now I think 23 or something like that. Just having a mm -hmm. birthday, and uh, I'm still working with him to help him uh, shape his career going forward. But again, it's that connection. You know, a son connects with his teacher. His teacher connects with him. I connect. Open arms. I ended up going to Malawi, we ended up setting up a business, Christoph, out in Malawi. 
and, uh, and lots and lots of things have, uh, have happened through that connection. So looking at the second aspiration, the freedom of, of peace, uh, and again, just some um, some stats. And this is um, uh, the, the, the way that um, conflicts, I can only see part of the screen here, but the way that conflicts have moved since 1946, since the end of the Second World War, to 2020. And of course, since then, and that's why I've put the, the blocks to the right of the screen there, and this was some time ago, there were already 350,000 soldiers from Russia and Ukraine killed, not to mention all the sadness and grief of the parents and families and so on. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking. And it will be a spike in that data. So you'd be looking at it, um, and it, it's easy to see how people will be misled to think we live in the most violent of times. Well, we don't. It's a blip on the graph of a move to a more peaceful world. And, uh, you know, I've also put in, again, just to put it into perspective, 14.91 estimated excess mortality due to COVID. So, um, but if you were to go back to 1300, <laughs> go back a bit further to see the, uh, the violence uh, in the world, you know, deaths due to violence, from there to 2010, it tells a completely different story. And I liken it to the stock market. You know, most of us here, I guess, have got uh, some form of pension either in play or building up. And those pensions rely on an increase of something like 4% uh, over any 10 year period in order to pay back our pensions. But within that, if you look at any day or any week in the stock market, it's like this. It's, uh, it's up and down and all over the place. Um, but if you look at the data and you look at the trends, it can lead you to believe. And I do believe, if you think about what's going on in Ukraine right now, I'm absolutely certain that the numbers of people working in the UN and in different uh, global organisations to make sure that never happens again, then I trust the power and the um, efforts of humanity to, to do that. And... Um, I just wanted to put this one back in because in the book, one of the stories I'd celebrate when you think about peace, Chris, he was with us today um, for many years now, has run a, um, a, a men's group, which we meet more or less monthly or thereabouts, yeah. uh, round at his place. And it's a very simple process where we get together Chris usually lights a fire in advance and we each have a log and we put a log in the fire and the and that celebrates that as a as a group of humans we uh, burn brighter as one there is more power in the fire you take the log out and, mm -hmm. and it goes out and then we go in we have a meditation and we share stories that um, can only be shared when there is trust but it's it's moving there are so many men that I've seen. And this doesn't have to be men, by the way, it can be women or a mixed group, but um, uh, it brings peace into the lives of those people. And I've seen that firsthand. And, and this, this man, VJ Mehta, invited me to speak at a peace conference. I think he'd read my book, Designing the Purposeful World, a few years ago, just after the SDGs came out, and he invited me to speak at a conference which had the proposition or asked the question, can we unite for peace? And uh, the, my input to the conference was, yes, we can. Not only yes, we can, but yes, we are. Because at that point, the world had united behind uh, SDG 16, which is all about peace. And, uh, and I also explained how this was something that we all had on our hearts because of the exercise that I've done with other people. I got in touch with VJ when I started writing this book. And he's written a new book, um, How Not to Go to War, a really simple concept of establishing departments for peace in governments worldwide, whether it's national government or local government. Um, uh, and it's such a simple concept. And why the world isn't doing it with every government on the planet, I'm sure it will happen. And, um, and that's, uh, that's his story. Uh, Owen... Uh, the, the guy that you can see in the photograph there, he um, is, a, is a culture change specialist. He works here at Prime East. 
And Jesse Rao, who is not the guy on the right, but he's, a, he's another uh, person that I know. Jesse Rao works in the States for a company called Appearing Global. And what you can see with the graphs there is the measurement of international cultures around the world. And if you think about it, and bear in mind, Jesse is based in the States, but when, when American organizations go and do business in other parts of the world, which they do frequently, um, the chance of those businesses being successful um, largely depends on how well people can go and work in other parts of the world in a harmonious way without creating conflict. And again, it wasn't until I started writing this book that I thought, actually, they're in the business of peace building. They're, they're giving people the opportunity to work around the world in harmony by looking at data and being prepared for going there rather than just jumping in with our big size 10 boots and causing problems. So again, I tell the story of Owen and Jesse in one of the stories there. Third aspiration is the joy of vitality. So remember, this is about well-being of all sorts, humans, all of life, and the climate. And again, are we, are we moving in a healthy direction? Well, just look at life expectancy. You know, as recent as, what is it, 1870? Very few people in the world expected to live beyond 40 years of age. And now, even in places like, you know, we often cite Africa, don't we? That still the expectancy is over 60 years. And in many parts of the world now, it's uh, way beyond that. It's, it's over 80. Med medicine has improved. Medicine is improved. One thing, you know, and also, um, you know, cure for diseases, certain diseases, and also the, the reason behind, um, say, for example, with regards to smoking, smoking pipe, tobacco, you know, yeah. um, relatives who, who, I have relatives who have sadly passed away to, you know, sort of cancer, but they, they um, you know, my grandpa or granddad used to smoke a pipe and you know i think my nana got passive smoking from that but it yeah, wasn't yeah. known that no. known that well my really. father was 40 a day and he did live to a ripe old age but he had mm -hmm. all sorts of problems with his lungs and and just that the, the average life expectancy of a homeless woman is still in the UK in the late 40s. Is it really? Oh. The last one at this point, I imagine I think it's 43. And, and to pick up on that point and kind of thinking about what Emma has been doing, uh, saying as well, is that anybody who is working to improve life expectancy and the well being of homeless women, and yeah. Chris, you work at uh, St George's mm -hmm. Crypt and supported them for many years. You're all working to that aspiration of vitality for all of humanity and all of the world. And uh, here's one that, uh, you know, that, again, this is one of my personal encounters in the book. Luke Bigwood used to work for Good Energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and he was in their communications team at Good Energy, Good Energy being a renewable energy provider. He recently mm -hmm. took up a new job, and I saw it on LinkedIn. I thought, oh, I must find out what that was all about. So Luke now works as um, head of uh, head of marketing or chief marketing officer, CMO for Environment Bank. Well, what is Environment Bank? Environment Bank is an organisation that uh, in the UK um, builders, developers have to be net by law have to be net positive on ecology. And um, and uh, and one of the ways they can do this, uh, Rice smile from Anthony, I think I know what's going on in his mind, but one of the ways they can do this is to pay into the environment for the environment bank to manage ecology on their behalf. So you could say that's kind of passing the book, but nevertheless, it is still meaning that money is being invested to preserve and uh, and, and improve ecology, this is in the UK. But uh, if, you, if you were to combine that, we talked earlier on about Rethink X and some of the predictions they've made. One of the predictions that is going to transform the world is uh, food. And, and basically within the next decade, we're likely to see a crossover of, um, and, and I might show you a graph in a minute, of where meat from precision fermentation 
will be something like a tenth of the price of meat from the slaughterhouse. And that is predicted to displace land area the size of three continents from pasture. And the, the, the um, opportunity that that presents to rewild and grow forests and everything else is absolutely phenomenal. So Luke is one of the people I celebrate. Heath Jackson was a guy that I coached uh, at a certain well-known global consultancy. And um, when I was coaching him, he was thinking about the work that he did and why he did it. And all of a sudden something triggered that he said, I don't ever want to do any work now that isn't in the best interests of a, a brighter future. And he's linked up now with this company, uh, Ecosia, which um, is creating green oases in the deserts of the ocean. And basically what they do is they create floating photovoltaic platforms and send down light trees into the ocean to stimulate life, which sequesters carbon. Mm -hmm. And the potential, so this is kind of in prototype stage, but the potential is that um, pound for pound, this has got more capability to sequester CO2 than many other things. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's the best, but it's just really powerful. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, most people will have not have heard of this. You know, how many people have heard of light trees? We're environmentalists in this room, and have we heard of light trees? I haven't mm -hmm. until he told me about that. He's coming to my house later this week to talk about a few other things. Here's another one, another one of my clients, actually, Tim Hopkinson at Poppleton. And uh, I'm working with the senior leadership team. In fact, I'm going back to work with them in Snowdonia in Wales um, next month. And uh, this is a company that's 100 years old and for 100 years have been manufacturing ducts, pipes. You can see them there. Now, who would have thought that they were working consciously towards the aspiration of vitality? Why is that the case? Well, most of their ducts end up in pharmaceutical laboratories or hospitals. And that's something I know I thought about when I was coming around from having, you know, hip replacement, knee replacement, lying in my hospital bed, just looking around thinking, it's easy to be grateful for the surgeon, but what about the anaesthetist, the nurse, the people that have given you the food, people that built the hospital, and even the people that have installed the duct team in those hospitals. It's a fabulous team effort. So fourth aspiration, spirit of abundance. Again, if you think of just work people living in poverty, take Chris's point there, but um, you know, the if, if you go back to 1820 and look at um, the, the share of people living in extreme poverty, 79% of the population compared with 9% today. And again, to look at all those predictions, we are moving in rapidly in, in, in a positive direction. And that's not to say, you know, one of the one of the uh, catchphrases for the SDGs is making sure we leave nobody behind. Mm -hmm. And you know a bit about homeless um, mm -hmm. women. I think you were talking about women yeah. in the UK is absolutely to the point. But nevertheless, having that aspiration of abundance uh, keeps everybody on the on the right track. And some of those stats that I mentioned earlier on. Look at those exponential curves for solar and wind generation, EV sales, battery storage sales. You can see those exponential curves beginning to, to, to kick in. And this is another interesting one, transport as a service compared to the individual ownership miles and vehicles and the, the, the miles of transport as a service, which doesn't necessarily mean autonomous. It could be Uber, <laughs> you know, it could be driven transport as a service, but um, those are the stats from the Rethink X research to say where this is uh, this is heading. So as you can see, part of this is the forecast. But the forecast is that by the time we get to 2030, very few of us will be owning our vehicles. We're more likely to be getting on our phones and calling up an autonomous vehicle that takes us around the place, which has all sorts of environmental benefits. This is the one I mentioned about uh, beef. So again, if you look at the uh, the price of um, of beef from pasture and the slaughterhouse compared with um, PF beef is precision fermentation and um, 
cell beef is, don't ask me to explain the difference between cell beef and precision fermentation beef. I keep reading about it and still haven't got it quite in my, in my, um, in my mind. But the point being that, you know, by the time we get to 2030, it will be far cheaper to buy meat that has not caused an animal to be slaughtered than it will be to have the novelty of a slaughtered animal. And of course, that has a big effect, not just on vitality, but also on the climate, which is why they're all in that aspiration of vitality. And, and, um, and so when, when it comes to abundance, um, when it comes to abundance, all is not what it seems. So this lady, Sushetta Jane, again, is another one of my clients from recent years. She and her husband, Shale, do software for revenue collection systems. What's that going to do with abundance, you might ask? But I was working with them on the topic of purpose as a consultant, and I asked, uh, and they asked me, what do you think of my our purpose, Clive? And I said, well, do you know what? I'm really, I'm really inspired by your purpose, but I had to read between the lines of your website to find it. Well, what do you mean? So, well, you make systems that allow um, local authorities, the states in America, to collect taxes more efficiently. And so what I'm assuming from that is that if they can collect revenue more efficiently, they can do more for their communities with the revenue that's collected. And not only that, it means that fewer people escape the taxation system, and therefore you can even bring taxes down and spread it more evenly and fairly across the community. So that's, again, something you wouldn't necessarily see. Most of you, I think, in this room know this man. He works here in Harrogate, Mike Kay, who's Managing Director at Energy Oasis. And again, his sole mission in life is to, um, first of all, reduce energy consumption by measuring it and then mitigating it, by doing things like he did with the car park at the Harrogate Conference Centre and replace sodium lamps with intelligent LEDs thereby saving 86% 86 of the power consumption and an equivalent amount of uh, carbon dioxide. I'm losing some of these. This week, again, he's been on. Um, we, did a, we did a shared event, I think, uh, Jemima, between Zero Carbon Harrogate and uh, UNA. Uh, this week is a hero of mine. I mentioned earlier on that I spent a bit of time in Malawi. I, I met this week at an event that I was facilitating um, and uh, I thought this guy's going places. And he's a permaculture enthusiast. He's now set up his own farm. He grows food. He basically has food, just like the photograph suggests, all year round. 12 months of the year, he's, he's harvesting food in abundance uh, at his, what he calls his permaculture paradise. And uh, Biswick and I had a conversation a few years ago about forests, and I was saying, when are you going to start getting into forestry, Biswick? Because as well as food, you could be sequestering carbon and doing all these amazing things. And a couple of years down the road, he said, by the way, Clive, he said, I've grown a forest. And I said, you've grown a forest? I said, you've been out planting trees. And he said, in Malawi, to create a forest, you don't need to plant trees. You just need to protect the land and the forest will grow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, more about him in the, in the book. Fifth aspiration, uh, infinite opportunity. And again, um, you know, the, this, this is just the rise of democracy, which I believe is giving uh, opportunity for people. Uh, and also the growth of, of literacy. If you look back to 1800, 90% of the population was illiterate. Now it's inverted. You know, we've got to the stage where 90% of the population is literate. And, and, that, and that carries on. You know, the problem hasn't gone away. We've still got many parts of the world where the education of girls and women uh, is, is tricky, to say the least. But this is the aspiration, is that we create opportunity for everybody to have an education, to match their needs, and the opportunity to live their best lives. Uh, if you look at uh, the way that things spread, um, that, are, that are helping to support our opportunities. And you look at the take up at curves of different things like, you know, the refrigerator or electricity or the telephone and start looking of late how long it takes things to become into fruition and reach maturity. 
it's like it is only about a decade. Mm -hmm. You know, think back to computers, social media, we've already talked about. Uh, this is the prediction of growth of AI in the education market in the States. Again, what you're seeing there is the bottom of another S curve. Actually, just triggers something, a memory, actually. I'm just thinking, um, I was up in 19, sorry, I hope you don't mind me saying No, no, no it's it was the 1940s day in um, Brassington, um, North Yorkshire, and I saw a mangle, and, and it's just kind of triggered, you know, like the, the how we've gone from a mango, a mango yeah. you know, which is not that long ago, my grandma had one, yeah. to to now, you know, washer dryers, for example, and that's just that memory kind of trigger yeah. that. So, uh, yeah. Well, I'm old enough to remember days when there were no computers in the workplace. Oh, yeah. And look what's happened since then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, if you look at the e-learning market, this is very dear to our hearts here at Prime East, but the growth of e-learning, um, mm. you know, which was accelerated by the pandemic, of course, um, but it's it's only going in one direction. And YouTube, mm. I mean, I find YouTube absolutely staggering to think that in two thousand and eight, it was barely a thing, mm. and now two billion users of YouTube. And where do most people go when they want to know something? I go straight to YouTube. Mm. It's my first port of call for just about anything. I've got an idea. Well, I wonder if the world's thought of this. And, mm. and often the world has thought of it and it's already happening. Mm. And uh, so again, some of these personal encounters of mine. So Kathy works for uh, a global business, 24,000 people. And uh, I'm not allowed to mention the name of the of the organisation, but she came to me and to the team here at Prime East to say, how can we give opportunity to our workforce to own their own careers, their own personal development, their own performance, their own well-being? And we put in place over the, over the course of a year a scheme that did that, which was a massive transformation. So many people at work expect their manager <laughs> to tell them when there's a training course mm -hmm. or to tell them when there's a promotion that they ought to be going for mm -hmm. and what this company has done is uh, changed all of that so that the ownership of all those things are with the individual and the managers rather than the people who are making things happen are the ones who facilitate it for the people who are you know in the driver's seat that, that that's actually a phrase that they couldn't be used in part of the process uh, Fergus Hamilton is a friend of our family, and he's already making artificial intelligence work for schools. The particular logic of uh, his product is that if people don't learn in a conventional way, whatever that means, because they've got a special interest or they might be on the spectrum or whatever it is, then their learning can be supported through the use of artificial intelligence, and the teachers can still focus on the, the, the core curriculum and still um, be able to help the, the, the kids or the young people who might be a bit different. And again, you recognize the photograph from earlier on. Um, so Fede or Federico is also in the book Under Opportunities. And the reason it's in there is not to do with the workshop that we ran at the UN. It's because I got in touch with him again and said, what are you up to now then, Fede? And he's out in uh, Colombia and he's working on, uh, he's set up a business to convert vehicles from um, internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. The reason he's done it is because his niece, I think it was, um, had a lung condition mm -hmm. and he worked out that the lung condition was due to pollution, the atmosphere in the big cities and uh, he was determined to do something about it. So he thought, well, one thing I can do is set up a company to increase electrification of vehicles. And he wanted to do that and look to the, the country for support. It, you know, he was uh, very well aware of the idea of these accelerator hubs, incubator hubs, whatever you call them, to help businesses off the ground. And all the ones that he could find were to do with IT. There was nothing that would support people working for the SDGs, for example. 
So we thought, well, do you know what? I'll set up my own accelerator hub, uh, incubator hub, and he set one up. And um, he's now, I forget how many, but he's already helped several organizations who have got sustainable development goals in their sites to uh, get off the ground. So I, put, I thought, well, that's worth putting in the chapter on opportunity. Mm -hmm. And finally, wisdom. And the, the little table there, without going into too much detail, is just to show the opportunity for wisdom in the world. And um, what you've got there is the, um, the, the, the way adult maturity works. And uh, it's using our seven levels of um, consciousness. So without going into too much detail, the basic level is for like Maslow's hierarchy of needs is about seven levels. <laughs> Right the way up to um, what is the top one there? Um, Serving. Serving. So, Serving. so the, the idea that where we where our main focus as, as humans is in serving humanity, 60 plus years on average, and this varies widely person to person, is when people begin to think about contributing to the well-being of future generations, humanity, and the planet. Why is that important? Because people are living longer. Mm -hmm. So there is actually more wisdom, supposedly, on the planet to tap into, if we care to do so. And some of the people that are doing that, um, the two gentlemen on the right there, Phil Clothier and Tor Enroth, have both been with a personal encounter um, of their own. Phil was the CEO at Barrett Value Centre, Tor was a director there. They now have their own organisation called Ankara which is kind of summarised in the book Growing a Culture for Sustainability, which they kind of asked me to write the foreword for. So they're in there. Um, wise words. Um, Bob Anderson, one of the most lovely and wisest men on the planet that I've been fortunate enough to meet, is the founder of the company the Leadership Circle, which does a diagnostic to shift leaders. It's, the diagnostic shows them how to move from being reactive in their work to being creative. And if you only look at the words in yellow in bold there, you know, he, his belief is in a new and thriving planetary future. And the key to it all is what he would describe as unity consciousness, the, the idea that I am not separate, but I am one with the inherent unity of all things which different faiths, different religions express in different ways around the, around the world, but basically we are all part of the same journey. And finally, my last person can't be with him on. And, uh, so when I want wisdom, this is where I go. You know, she's now, she'd be 96 this year, and this is her sitting in the uh, seat of my camper van, having a Chinese meal. Um, but basically the whole family, if they have problems, challenges, they, they'll go and spend a bit of time, I call it Granny's Cafe. Mm -hmm. And um, not because she's got great words of advice, but because she listens. Mm -hmm. And that is basically the book. The book also, well, it's the first part of the book. Second part of the book talks about what character are you? And this is really important for me um, because, you know, all working towards this idea of a brighter future, and you've got the innovators, the facilitators, the connectors, the evangelists, activists, and so on, and a few renegades like the apathists who don't care one way or another, got better things to focus on, the deniers who actively don't believe that it, that it is a thing, and you know, just say, well, you know what, climate change is it's just the way the world works or whatever. And the saboteurs who are actively um, taking a, a contra agenda. But these are all at play in the world. And the, the point being that we tend to gravitate to people who are the same as us or similar to us. You know, the innovators go and talk with other innovators. And you know, most of us avoid the saboteurs like the plague. But actually, if we want to make progress in this journey to a brighter future, we need to talk to people who think differently to ourselves. And that's a belief. So, you know, the book talks about, well, who are you in all of this? You know, you might have a little look at that slide and think who you are. I could 
almost gets for most people in the room today. Mm -hmm. You know, but for myself, I like to think that I'm a connector, probably an optimist and an encourager. Uh, and that's probably me. That's what I do in the journey. You, you will have your own um, your own characteristics. And if we had time, we could, we could explore them. In fact, we can explore them. Because if you get your phones out again, and say with you, Hester, back at home, point it at the, at the Slido code. I think it's still got data from the last session I had, but we'll add yours into it. To see what we've, uh, we've got, it should still be open. So, so, on the same page that you were on before, you can put the QR code in again. You can vote for as many of these as you like, but I would say, you know, go for three or four. And David, if you tell me where you think you sit in all of this, and David, for you, let me just page down so that you can actually see them all. Oh, yeah. I don't suppose you're a saboteur, but uh, anyway, what would you say you were? I'd been an innovator. An innovator? Great. I'm, 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 I'm a connector. An innovator and a connector. And don't, don't forget to hit send, which is at the bottom of the screen if you're on a smartphone. Anything else, David? An activist. An activist. Fabulous. Definitely an optimist. And definitely and an optimist as well. You see, we can be we can be combinations of things, and it's just it's good to know what we are, and also it's good to know what we're not. Because it might be just worth having a conversation with um, people who are different than us. So have you have you managed to vote? Did you manage to do it? Yeah, yeah. So um, this will have other data in, but um, that's just Lots of optimists. Lots of optimists. Mm. Unsurprising. And, um, mm -hmm. and all the others. I have an apathist. I don't know if it's one of you or one of the last group that I have, but uh, I did have an apathist and a saboteur. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course, we, we mustn't make assumptions as to what they were sabotaging. <laughs> But it's just a, a neat little thing to do just to get over the point that we are different. And if we're going to make progress on this journey, then we perhaps need to engage with others. Oh, come on, one, two, four. The third part of the book is about the wisdom code. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but because wisdom was that outlier of the six that none of the SDGs mapped towards, I thought it was worth going into in a bit more detail, giving people a chance to think about wisdom and also to offer some ways to raise people's levels of wisdom by doing things, you know, by the, the actions that they take, the, um, the attitude that they have, the relationships that they have. And so there's lots in there. And finally, you'll recognize from the, the thing up there, uh, alignment is fractal. And this is taking me right back to where my journey in purposeful leadership began. This is the prime focus framework. And what I mean by this is fractal. So Benoit Mandelbrot was the father of fractal mathematics. And he said, with most things in life, what you see at one level, you will see repeated in similar ways at another level. So just as um, um, human beings might align their talents to, um, uh, to, to those of the team or the align their purpose to the purpose of a team and a team needs to align to an organization if we're going to make rapid progress organizations and teams and individuals also can usefully align to the purpose of um, building a brighter future for humanity in the world uh, which has the vision of the six aspirations and again that's what the last bit of the book is so <coughs> Let's um, stop sharing, since we're all together and I'm conscious I've done most of the talking so far. Thoughts, comments? Let's see, let's see if Esther's still with us. Are you still with us, Esther? That's a hand. You've got a hand up. Unmute yourself and ask us a question if you can. Yeah. You need to unmute yourself, Esther.
The alternative, if you can't unmute yourself, Hester, is to it, can you can you get into the chat? You'll notice along the bottom of your screen, if you move the cursor around, that there's a there's a chat button, and you could put your question into the chat because we're not hearing you at the moment, Hester. You're muted. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that you can get your question to us one way or another. We can't hear you. You're, you're still muted. So while Hester is grappling with the technology, and I don't know that we can help her, can we, Anthony? Not really. I mean, not really. <clears throat> only ask somebody to unmute you, can't unmute you. Yeah. <clears throat> All we can do is. Mike, can I ask a question about when the, when the water book will be? So when when will the book the book will be finished being written this year? Is that better? Yeah. Is that better? So Hester, <laughs> wonders of wonders, you're you're with the room. So what would you like to ask? Emma's asked a question, but we'll come back to her because we're not going to lose Emma. So uh, in case we lose you, what is your question? Um. Well, I'm so sorry, my hearing is poor and I'm not hearing everything. I've, I've absolutely got most of it and the gist of it, obviously. Sure. But there were two things. I I don't know whether this is relevant, but there, well, there could be more than two. But um, well, you well. are so optimistic. So I just want to challenge a bit. Um, what do we do, what can we do by reducing and possibly eliminating the whole ethos of hate that seems to go around in the world at the moment, not only through social media, but in all sorts of other uh, yeah. respects as well, that hate, hate language, is becoming far, far too common. I, um, that's one thing. And the other thing is the plight of girls and women still. You talked about the increase in education, but is that true of girls and women? And the way that they are still treated in so many countries because of the culture. And I think changing cultures is not only difficult, it can be dangerous. Yes, yes. Don't, don't ask me another one because I'll lose it. But uh, if, I can, if I can start with hate. So there are, there are two places that you could, that within the aspirations that you could consider hate. So one is in connection, because if you remember when I was talking about connection, I, I included in that the idea of love and compassion. And of course, love is pretty well the opposite of hate. You know, most motivations in life are either away from fear or towards love. And, uh, and, and hate is something that we would like to see less of in the world. And in terms of things that are driving hate, um, we've got things like the polarization that we get with social media, and hate has, has many forms. So I think I think less hate as a as a kind of a double negative is definitely something that most people would want to see in their brighter future. I don't think there would be anybody in this room that would like to see more hate, hate in the world. And certainly the people I've engaged with over the years, I've not I've not seen anybody that would want to see more hate. And of course, the other thing is that hate is also a bit of an antidote to peace. So there's another aspiration is of a more peaceful society. And uh, you don't have a peaceful society when there's hate playing out. So anybody who is working to remove hate from the world is working towards one of those two aspirations at the very least. It could be others as well. So, um, and also, if you, if you were to... If that was the thing you were really interested in, I'd be encouraging somebody who felt um, felt passionately about reducing hate to to follow Steve Pinker's advice and look at the data. Is there more hate in the world now? How have 
how have levels of eight in the world moved over the years? And, and, and a bit like um, when you're looking at violence, because I think they kind of go hand in hand, you'll probably find that there is less hate in the world now because we live more in peace than we did. But I don't know. It's, it's not something I've researched. And then coming back, coming to your second question, um, the bit about uh, educating women and girls, um, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that women and girls are more educated now than ever before. But a bit like Chris's point about uh, women, homeless women on the streets of the UK, there will be places, and we know there are places, um, where women find it very hard to be educated. In fact, it's uh, it's completely contrary to the, the system. But if you were to look at, is that moving in the right direction? And one thing I do know is that I got very interested at one point in uh, the, the size of the world population and uh, worrying that the population has been growing for years and years and years and decades. But in actual fact, um, most predictions are that the world's population will decline before we get to the end of this decade. And one of the reasons that it will decline is because of the increased education of women and girls. For two reasons. First of all, they're more aware of contraception. And the other reason being that they are uh, keen on having careers. There are probably even some that don't want to bring children into the world because of their fear. So um, I, I, I'm still hopeful that we will get to a point at some point where every girl, this is my wish, this is certainly my, um, my hope for the future, is that everybody on the planet, women, girls, and everybody else, will be able to have whatever education they need to bring their best selves into play for the future that we all want. What does anybody else think? Any, any thoughts on that? Around, I mean. Yes, no, absolutely. Just coming back on two things, really. I don't disagree with everything you say, but I, it still worries me. I feel that hate and anger that goes with it is such a waste of energy. Yes. And it's so destructive. But, you know, when our energy is used, is needed so much in, in other respects. And the other one, I do feel this question so much about. Um, girls' education and all sorts of other um, ways in which women are kept down, but um, it is because of the um, men, uh, you know, the dominance of a men culture. Yes. And I just feel if you try to interfere with uh, centuries-old cultures, that you're going to actually lead to more hate and anger and conflict. That you've got yes. to that particular issue so very, very sensitively. Yes. And there are, this is my hypothesis for the testing, there are millions of people trying to reduce the levels of hate in the world in lots and lots of different ways. I'm looking at Jemima because I know she's one of them. Um, but, um, you know, th th there are a lot of people putting a lot of effort into reducing the level of hate in the world, just that there are, there are millions of people uh, and in fact, is one of the sustainable development goals, gender equality, and uh, and also education. You couple those two together to try and bring the education of girls and women to the level that it needs to be. So yes, Dave. David's got a question. Well, no, it's a response. Um, in that, in one sense, you greatly emphasise the development of technology. Yeah. And um, the YouTube communication and everything. I find it, it sponsors or fosters cynicism. Um, and cynicism is uh, in between sort of hate and violence and a whole array of things. Yes. And, um, I think that the media, um, is, if you look at comedy and you look at um, the development of television or radio television, yes, uh, and now the vast arrays of it. Uh, and you look at the news, um, I, I just find a, a, a disturbing acceleration of cynicism that goes with the development of technology, yes, and 
uh, I don't want to know technology. Um, you know, I've, I've given up trying to cope with it because of it. it's so vast and, yes. and uh, I'm beyond it, but I'm also beyond it because I don't want to know it yes. because of the directions of it. And I don't know how to re-educate the BBC, for instance, who we deem to be the beautiful auntie. Have you written to it? Uh, yes. Right. And, and uh, you... Well, most times you don't get any reply. Yes. And various organisations I've written to with acute concern, uh, and you just get a platitude back. Yes. Keep up the good work where you are. Yes. I, I mean, if you... If you... Go back to first principles. Hate is definitely a subset of violence and also a subset of lack of compassionate connection between people. So it falls into two of the aspirations. And there will be millions of people, I absolutely yes. absolutely, who are working towards a reduction of hate in the world and who are. Um, you know, in making that their life's work. And I think part of the hate that has arisen um, is because of, uh, as a byproduct of other things like social media. You know, social media has had the power to polarise the world over recent years just because of the way it's structured. And whatever you think about the man, for example, Elon Musk, I was listening to a, a programme about him, about his uh, takeover of Twitter, and he talks about the polarization of social media as it is at the moment and his desire to move the social media um, what does he call it about the, the, the town square um, back towards the middle so that more things are in the middle ground and less is in the extremes. That's part of his um, keenness to um, to buy Twitter and turn it into X. Now, I'm not passing a judgment, good or bad, on that, but there will be people who are trying to um, to move towards a less hateful world. And there are different ways of doing it. You know, coming off social media is a way. You know, going into meditation and retreats is a way. Just, just having more wisdom in the world is a way. And, and, ever, and, and also, wherever we see that, going right back to the title slide of noticing, encouraging, and celebrating that, wherever we see it is a way. Now, Emma, you, you had a question, and we kind of bypassed it. What was your original question? So, Kai, I said, when will your book be ready for the reading? Book, yes, the book will be written by the end of the year. Unless I can my and providing my editing publisher at Routledge likes it, it will be published at some point next year. So I don't know when. My guess is it will be probably you know. Well, I'm hoping that will be the summer, but uh, you know, publishers at yeah. the wrong pace, and I don't think anything I do will particularly accelerate it. So um, yeah, at some point, some point in the summer, provide we wish, as well. We wish you all the best with the progress of it. Then. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll be looking for those book launches, Clive, as you tour the country. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we were just talking about it in here at Prime East this this afternoon. So um, yeah, I, I, I funnily enough, with my previous books, I never did any book launches mm -hmm. as such. Mm -hmm. but my, yeah, my, yeah. my colleagues were uh, encouraging me. And there may be one or two opportunities. But I, I am conscious of the, of the time. But yeah. Are there any other questions or thoughts before I hand back to Emma to, to close? There was a reference to mangles, <laughs> and it took me miles away to. Yes, that was Emma, yeah. I mean, I used to turn the mangle for my mother, mm. and uh, then she got an Ada automatic. She's called Ada. Oh, she was called Ada. Yes. Yeah. And she got an Adamatic. And she was the happiest bunner that it was electric. And uh, you just fed things into it. And uh, uh, she was over the moon by it. But the thing that crossed my mind is, what did you do with the time that you saved? Uh, uh, all the uh, directions and everything. I don't know that we're improving humanity we're, we're living longer because we're not straining ourselves as much yes but yes. i don't think we're 
uh, being more, I mean, if we put it to producing food um, and, and things of and things of that nature, uh, one, you know, uh, uh, but I don't know that all the developments of humanity are enhancing humanity somehow. Well, of course, when you say enhancing, the obvious question is in what way? Well, health it, is health is the automatic one. Uh, yes, you know, mum lived to be eighty-eight. Yes, which yes. was a lot longer than her mother. Yes. Um, so, so health is is a direct one, but um, uh, it, it, it's it, 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 I can't answer my own question. <laughs> so, well, this may or may not be healthy. But were big advances that we're just at the beginning of is artificial intelligence. And again, if you start to look at the data and the predictions, we saw some of that data on the slides, and the, um, the forecasts are that artificial intelligence will displace a lot of the labor that we have to attend to as human beings. A lot of, I mean, it's, it's already happening, isn't it? When you look at call centers and Lots and lots of things, good, good or bad, and I almost feel actually itching, but, but, but nevertheless, the predictions are that they are very slow. Look at taxi drivers, there, there'll be no taxi drivers 20 years from now, it'll be all autonomous vehicles, mm. and the taxi drivers mm. won't be doing that work. So, you then then begs the question, what will we be doing? And mm. um, again, it's up to us, to engineers, society, as humanity, to make sure that this provides opportunities for people to lead their best lives. And whether that's to, you know, move from being a taxi driver to being a musician or an artist mm. or whatever, and whether it's to move away from, um, you know, tilling the soil to um, being able to leave that to machines, because that's, that's happening, it's already happening to a large extent. You know, all those things present opportunities if we choose to see the, the opportunities that, uh, that the progress makes. Mm. And of course, it can be a nightmare. Mm. You know, we know the threats that artificial intelligence uh, present. Mm. But um, one of the things that always makes me filled with hope um, is that uh, we usually end up doing the right things eventually. Human humans and humanity has got a habit. You can probably see it in our own lives. I know that, for example, I have to know that I need to lose a bit of weight. But until my knees start hurting, um, I, I kind of put it off until tomorrow. But eventually, the pain's too much, and I end up doing something that will help me along the way. And and I think I don't know what you think, Jemima, with climate change, because I know that's your your baby, really. But uh, my belief is we will incur a great deal of pain on the journey to mitigating the climate crisis, but we'll do it because of the ingenuity of, of humanity. We will get there. There are so many things going on in that climate space that are really exciting. Yes, but if you take um, Mother Nature and the Earth, yes, um, we've already flaunted it. We have the point that the general secretary, the secretary general of the UN this year yeah. has announced that the earth is on fire. Yeah. Yes. And that the oceans are boiling. It was and yeah. Yeah. When you say there's going to be a turnaround, there's no evidence. Of, yeah. uh, you know, he said that and then the media stopped, stopped it. No reporters are really in investigated all of that. Well, um, people have investigated. Well, the climate change scientists have been warning it since 1972. Yeah. Exactly. The first meeting of the UN. And, 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 the, and the metaphor there is people have warned me about getting too big. I'm worried about my knees for, for years, probably since I stopped playing rugby. But, you know, we, we will incur, and again, I, I welcome Jemima to offer a point of view as probably the most knowledgeable on the climate, I don't know, maybe Anthony is, maybe Anthony will offer you, mm -hmm. he hates you to pay for me anyway, but my, my belief is we will incur a great deal of pain on the real sustainable the climate crisis, but we will, we will get there. I certainly hope so. Do, do either of you want to pick up that button and offer a view? Well, I've certainly got a view, I don't have to go over. Uh, I, I take apathist because I am 
very, very pessimistic. I mean, you picked up the word utopia, and I fear that we are looking at a utopia. And utopia means a non-place, a place which doesn't exist. Yeah. And I fear that's what it is. Because we see in our local uh, country, we see the government um, authorising coal mines, authorising new yeah. oil and gas. We see vastly increasing inequality in this country, in most of the developed countries. We see in the uh, United States, like the Johnson regime here, um, the, the the culture of untruth, denial, yes. and, and, and the dis destruction, if possible, of democracy. We also, so you're talking about Elon Musk. Yeah. yeah. Elon Musk is, a, is the richest man in the world. Yeah, he is. That one man has incredible power. You probably read about the Ukraine war. Yeah. Where he was providing the communications network yeah. to the Ukraine army. They had some robot submarines on their way yeah. to destroy the Black Sea fleet. And Elon Musk said, I don't think they should do that. Switch off the communications. And they did. That's I've been, I've been that, that, that's actually been misreported. Oh, all right then. Well, perhaps. And, um, perhaps and again, you know, I'm conscious that we are recording um, John Smitty, but um, apparently, yeah, um, because I I too was concerned about yeah. this. I mean, I have shares in Tesla, and um, uh, and I was keen to know what his stance is, and so I uh, watched a conference where he was explaining this, mm -hmm. and apparently he's he's an American, and uh, he would only do what um, was approved by the American government. And the American government um, basically talked about, and this comes on, you know, don't, don't trust me, look, look at it for yourself, was that um, the, uh, the, the support is only within the, what was the Ukraine borders prior to the, uh, the latest conflict. And so it isn't, it isn't authorized Real on most support or anything within the territory of Crimea. But check it out for yourself, okay. you know. Okay, well, but all right, I'll, I'll accept that that is a, as a false example. But I think the other things that I've mentioned are great, yes. unfortunately, for, for, for serious pessimism. Oh, yeah. And, and yes. um, you know, we all work hard, but I'm beginning to worry that our heads are being sort of Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you mind? Just one more question, because I've been conscious of it before then. No, I... uh, sorry. No, no. Yeah. No, no, no. no, 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 no. have one more. Um, uh, uh, oh, no. I think that's how that's 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 that all the time. Yeah. 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 Yes. But, um, Clive, we'd like to thank you very much yeah. for sharing, sharing your, um, your views and um, your book and how progress is going. And, and also, you're so widely connected and well connected and just sharing those examples and and you know just what you've experienced in terms of going out to various you know international um countries uh, uh because of what you believe in and and how it has driven you so i think it was really commendable to see that on your presentation slides so thank you um, but then we have the topics, please, for the next event. Please, um, you know, my contact details, you'd like to get in touch. Um, and we will 